Oh, good morning, everybody. All I can say is, wow. Somebody say, I'm taking it back. The devil can't stop me. God has anointed me for such a time as this. Aren't you glad we're overtimers? Apostle David, you know, um, um, you're surrounded by the goodness of God. And uh, the Holy Spirit said that to me. I think it was in April, okay? And when he said it to me, I'm like, you know, what do you mean by that, God, you know? And then, and then all of a sudden, I saw the people. And it, and, and it dawned on me that I'm surrounded by the goodness of God, which is the people. That the goodness of God is in you. And you matter, and you're important, and you're part of this thing. Amen? Amen. It's just amazing. And, you know, here today, Apostle David, you're surrounded by the goodness of God. And we love you and appreciate it. I've told you many times over the years that you're my hero. <laughs> I shouldn't even say that. I know some good things about Apostle David that you don't know. You know probably all the bad things about him. But there was a few good things about the man, you know, that we managed to find out over the years. But anyway, he's a great man of God. If you want to see a hero, there he is right there. There he is. He's affected the lives of thousands of people, thousands of people. I just told Apostle David uh, this morning that we have a new church in China. So now we have three churches, three Spirit of Life Global Cause Network churches in China. This one's a thousand miles away from our church in Shenzhen. So Apostle David, now that we call you Apostle Skinny, you're going back to China now as soon as they drop this. Right now, you know, we, can't fly, we can fly into China, but it's a 21-day uh, quarantine. And who wants to sit in a hotel room for 21 days in prayer and fasting? Apostle David would do that, I know. <laughs> but not me. Amen. Eric, just hang with me for a minute, okay? I'm going to read a scripture, and then I'm going to show you a little something on the screen. I wasn't expecting to preach today, but, you know, Apostle David always says this thing about him, like, the more you do, the less I have to do, and that's what I like it. Have you all ever heard him say things like that? You know, he's really good at these country sayings. And uh, he says things like, uh, and he, he just, I mean, the religious spirits go nuts around Apostle David. But I remember one time he said this. He said, I'm not smart enough to know the things I don't know. And when people hear that, they're like, it's like a pause. Because we've been around a polytech. You know what a polytech means? A polytech is a well-schooled person. I mean, they just know all, they have all this vast knowledge. That's Apostle David. He is, a, he is a polytech. And he'll say things like, I'm not smart enough to know the things I don't know. And then everybody looks at him like, he's a guru or something. I don't know. But when we were in China, when we were in China, uh, the time the Apostle David <laughs> went, um, it's me and Cornell. Cornell is, is my black son, Okay. He's, a, he's my spiritual son, Cornell. He's black. And then me and then Apostle David, we're walking down the street. And Apostle David says, you know what? We're the only three in this nation. You've got one black guy, one, one blonde-headed guy, and a fat guy. <laughs> <laughs> and I was thinking, you know, all the gurus in China, they're, they're not skinny like the people are. And I was thinking, if we could just get Apostle David a robe. You know, and get a life's belt. They'd be coming up to him, out, and who knows, they would have been doing all kinds of things, you know. And we'd have got you over the hump. But anyhow, it's too skinny now, so anyway, we got to find somebody else. <laughs> Go with me to Judges chapter 2 this morning. Good morning, everybody. You know, Apostle David said it. This isn't a day to mourn. This is a day to celebrate. Amen. It's a new day. You heard the prophecy. It said that God is restoring, and we believe that. And, I, and you know what? I've been around here. You know, I have seen God do things here. And I've seen the lots of people here being affected. And I've also seen the level of warfare that we've had here. And not, ev not everybody made it. It doesn't mean that they're bad people, but not everybody was able to hang in there. And you know what? We don't get on anybody's case about that because we're in a war. Amen? And we understand warfare. And we understand that God gave us power. Amen? Over all the works of the enemy. And we're not afraid. But, you know, we've got to understand that some people get weary. You know what I mean? But those of you that are here, you are the warriors. You are the ones that made it, amen? And uh, you know what? There's others that are going to be coming back, and I've had that happen in my church. My church is 30 years old, 
And, you know, there's people that, that left my church for one reason or the other. And I never really concentrate on it when people leave the church. I just listen to God and preach what he says. Listen to God and preach what he says. And then, like Apostle David used to say, you know, what was that thing he used to say about um, something about happy trails or something like that? <laughs> And just focus on God. See, you guys are laughing because you know him. I keep pulling him in all the time because he's had this impression on me. And I'm very impressionable when it comes around, when I come around him because he does impressionable things. Are you in the book of Judges? Go with me to verse number six. Father, we thank you today for the anointing. We recognize it's not by might nor power, but it's by your spirit. I thank you, Lord God, that we are celebrating 4th of July tomorrow, and it means Independence Day. Thank you, Lord God, that you, are, that you have set us free and you have given us liberty, God, for the Lord is our Savior and our deliverer and our freedom in Jesus' name. Now look at verse number six here. This is the book of Judges. Moses is gone. <clears throat> and it says in verse six, And when Joshua had let the people go, the children of Israel went every man into his inheritance to what? To possess the land. Now, you know, wherever it says possess the land, there's a bit of warfare involved in that. Isn't that right? <clears throat> you know, everything God does for us, there's warfare in it. I wish it wasn't so, but I can tell you this. Every good thing I ever got from God, we had to fight to get it. Because the devil steps in and he battles against you. So what we have to do today, we have to learn how to fight back. Amen. And we don't let the devil just push us over. But this generation, you know, our generation, we learn to fight. And uh, we're not afraid of it, amen. God told us the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God, through the pulling down of strongholds, amen. So, uh, you know, our prayer life's different. We sound different. I mean, our church songs are different. And uh, they're, they're militant and fervent, and they've got apostolic anointing in them, amen. And uh, they make religious uh, spirits uncomfortable, and that's the way it should be anyway. <clears throat> but anyway, it says, and the people serve the Lord... All the days of who? All the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died being 110 years old. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in Timonath in the Mount of Ephraim on the north side of the hill Gash. Now, verse 10, and also all the generation was gathered into their fathers, and there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. Now, listen to this. I believe that we're in this stage right here in America, and there are a lot of people that don't know God the same way you and I know God. You know, we've had an experience with God. We've had an encounter with God, and it changed us, amen? It's an unforgettable, uh, unforgettable moment that we had with God. It's called an encounter. And what we have today is we have people that have never encountered God the same way that we encountered him. You know, the reason why you're here is because you've had an encounter with God. You've had an experience with God. I mean, something happened on the inside of you that's drawing you here. And so when you hear words of life coming out of Apostle David and Pastor Randy, we, I mean, uh, uh, Andrew here, uh, what's your name again? <laughs> Anthony. What happens is the, 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 the guy that was rallying us, what was his name here? Andy or something like that. But when we hear, you know, like, look at, what, look at the anointing that was coming out of Pastor Andy. You see what I mean? What that is, that's the, that's, that's the power of God that comes out of that encounter that he's had with God. And so all of us here, we've had an encounter with God. But yet, there's a nation called America that has people like us. But guess what? There's a nation called America that's falling apart that don't know the God we know, and they don't even know what liberty really is all about. So I just want to take for just a minute, Eric, you queuing up out there? Go ahead and let's, talk, let's look at a short video. I want to show you something, and then we'll go from there.
Why? I don't know. I don't know. What is the purpose of 4th of July celebrations? I'm going to turn it to the guy in the USA shirt. Sure. Fireworks. A little more specific. <laughs> a little more specific. Celebrating our independence. There we go. A little more specific still. Independence. Day. From a country. Uh, step in here at any time. <laughs> uh, which country was that? History was not my subject. I slept through that class. And happy yeah. Fourth of July. Thank you. Happy Fourth to you guys. When Jesse Ventura, John Wilkes Booth, and the other founding fathers signed the Declaration of Independence, what year was that? 1970, sorry, 1870 something, but I don't remember the specific year. Mm. What's the purpose of Fourth of July weekend? I know, celebrate our independence. A little more specifically, please. I, I really don't know. I, I, I don't know. I mean, that's, that's all I know. Yeah, I'm revoking your celebration. <laughs> You're no longer allowed to celebrate. <laughs> celebration canceled. Name two of the founding fathers of the United States. Oh, man, you had to start there, huh? Washington. Hey, no, I'd ask him, not you. Oh. Okay, name one more. George and uh, Lincoln. No. <laughs> hey, pipe down over there. It was supposed to be... <laughs> You're not putting this one on the We're going to have to deport you. <laughs> yeah. You don't deserve to be in America. Yeah. Get out of our country. <laughs> what year did the Declaration of Independence get signed? Just you. You first. Oh, s***. Watch your mouth. I'm sorry. Um, I don't remember, honestly. Um, 1875? What year was the Declaration of Independence signed? God. <laughs> Come on, man. Well, you don't, don't give off it away. Off top of my head, I don't know. Yep, top, it's, it's buried deep in there somewhere. That's like what I'm saying, off top fourth, of my head. Fourth I don't grade. know, bro. Uh, hold on, we're still not done with you. We're, we're celebrating independence. What does that mean exactly? Independence from who? Fourth of July, what year? Come on. Hold on. Don't give it away. <laughs> Come on, man. You're putting him on the uh, spot. You're putting him on the spot. Just, he needs a safe space. <laughs> Fourth of July weekend, we celebrate the Civil War victory, the North <laughs> over the South, freeing of the slaves. What are you going to be doing to commemorate that? That's a good question. Probably just out with family, friends, you know, enjoying ourselves. We're out in San Diego, you know, we got to enjoy the sun, the, sea, the surf, the weather, good people. What year was the Declaration of Independence signed? That, my friend, has been a long time for me. <laughs> Fourth of July weekend, we sort of celebrate John Wilkes Booth, Jesse Ventura, the other founding fathers. <laughs> Who's your favorite founding father? My favorite founding father is... Who you got to pick out of? Um, I don't know. Who, who are my choices? Are any of them? <laughs> this isn't multiple choice. Oh, okay. Um, founding father, Jesse Ventura. <laughs> That's my favorite. That can't be your favorite. You got to pick another can't one. Can't be mine. I don't even have one. No, don't even have one. Well, if you had one, what would it be? Yeah, be. Who would you say? I say. Nope. No, we'll get to you next. <laughs> okay, we better get to you next. Yeah, yeah. Tell me, tell me. <laughs> favorite founding father. Hey, oh, I don't know what my options is. I say Jeremiah. Jeremiah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wrong answer. <laughs> Fourth of July weekend, we are celebrating our independence from China. Okay. Just checking to see what people are doing to celebrate that victory over the Chinese. Well, I mean, the families always get together, you know, and they just come to the beach and just, you know, have a good time. They just barbecue. Smoke some weed. Yeah, you know, you know how that goes. But, I mean... I mean, I mean, it's just a family Forget day. Forget about you know? our history and just have some good times, right? Yeah, I mean, everybody's just having a good time. Well, I think uh, most people, time, I think. most people forgot what they it's really about. They definitely have. But Thanks I mean, for demonstrating <laughs> it brings it brings everybody together, it though, does. which is that's a good thing. That's all that matters, though. Yeah, that, that's really all that it's about, you know. When we 
won World War II, celebrating <laughs> the victory over the axis of evil on 4th of July. Just checking to see what you're going to be doing to celebrate the victory over the Nazis this, <laughs> this weekend. Uh, I'm going to go party. Sir. Party? Probably, yes. And lose more brain cells. Maybe. Possibly. But Definitely. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thanks for demonstrating that. We are celebrating a certain Independence Day. Tell us what that is exactly. Uh, so the United States got independence from, uh, I guess, England, right? Yes. Yeah, 1776. Hey! Tell me so anything else. This is going to get edited <laughs> out because I didn't add, like, answer a dumb answer. No, we like to, we're okay. trying to, we've oh, been yeah, trying yeah. to find someone like you. Okay, so what about it? I'm um, one of the founding fathers. Uh, Benjamin Franklin. All Tom, right. Thomas Jefferson. Alexander hey. Hamilton. <laughs> All right. John Hancock. Yes. <laughs> Thank you okay. for thinking. That's right. That was great. Yeah. Appreciate that. Nice to meet you guys. Thanks, guys. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, ensure dom domestic tranquility to ourselves and our posterity, to ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Happy Fourth of July, y'all. Have a great one. Yes. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to YouTube. <laughs> Hallelujah. Did we have a generation that's missed God here? You know, it's amazing that we have people that don't even know what we're celebrating, isn't it? This is the dumbing down of America. This is what's happening with the woke group, amen? They're so woke, they're messing us all up. But what we've got to do is we've got to get back to God. You know, who the sun sets free is free indeed, amen? You know, when I was here before, we were talking about what's different today than it was 30 years ago. One of the things that, you know, that I talked about then was that, you know, we've all come to understand a little bit of the revelation that God gave us five ascension gifts, that Jesus, after he was risen, gave us five different ascension gifts of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the perfecting, or in other words, the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. And the work of ministry is not necessarily you putting on a white suit and coming up on the platform preaching and blowing everybody down. The work of the ministry is doing what God has called you to do. And every one of you, God has put a gift in. You matter and you're important. Amen. The Bible says that every joint supplies increase to the body. So we have to understand something. You know, like 30 years ago uh, when I was in church, well, no, before that, when I was in the church as a little boy, it was really basically uh, the messages were, you know, Jesus is returning and uh, you need to be rapture ready. And that was being preached all the time. Be rapture ready, rapture ready, rapture ready, rapture ready. And we heard it all the time. And, uh, and how many people could agree with that? You heard that. Anybody beside me? And we heard it all the time. And, you know, we're, and the thing is, you know, if you're born again, you rapture ready, man. You're not going to get any more rapture ready. You're ready. And so the point is, though, that what happened was back then, we pretty much hired the pastor to do all the ministry for us. And if he had a wife that could play the piano, that was all the better because then we got our worship leader for nothing. But we missed the part, you know, where the perfecting of the saints, which is the Greek word cardatismos, which means equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. We missed that because our mindset was we weren't called to do anything except get saved and wait for the rapture. And really what happened, it affected this because the devil was able then to do things that he would not be able to do with us around today. Do you understand? The devil was able to, 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 to run rapid. And uh, so what happened was we missed the part where we are called into ministry because we have the gospel of the kingdom in us, amen? And we are the light of the world and we are the salt of the world, amen? So basically today is very different than it was back then because, you know, we understand, we understand that we need to be born again. We understand that we need to be rapture ready. But we also understand this, that Jesus said, occupy till I come. In other words, be about the Father's business. You know, we can't take a back seat and be quiet. Amen? You know, uh, there's, there's, there's got to be that militancy and that fervency in us that we don't let the devil just get away with everything without us saying a thing. Because if you do, what happens is you get a whole generation that doesn't even know why you're celebrating Independence Day. They have no idea. You know, Jesse Ventura was not a founding father. 
You know, if, if I recall, I mean, wasn't he like a the governor of Michigan or something like that and a wrestler? Isn't that right? So he surely was, he, he really wasn't, you know, one of the founding fathers, you know. But you can see what's happening. This is the dumbing down that's taking place all around us, okay? And what we have is we have, we have to come into the understanding that we are, in, we are in a hostile environment, a hostile spiritual environment. The Apostle Paul said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. So what he did was he pulled back the curtain to let us see the battle that's in the unseen spirit world that's going on around about us. So we have to be equipped. So it's got to be more than just having heard the word of God, having went to church one time, having been to Sunday school one time. It's got to be different than that. We have to understand that God has anointed us for such a time as this, that we carry the power of God Almighty. Amen. And we can call those things that be not as though they are. We can bind the devil in Jesus name. We can loose. Amen. We can call those things that be not as though they are. So what we have is we have spiritual principles. I call them the laws of the kingdom of God that belong to us. We can speak to a mountain and it'll be moved. Amen. Well, I didn't hear all of these things when I was a little boy in church. Maybe you did, but I didn't. I didn't know anything about bonding and loosening, but I found it fascinating that we could cast out devils whenever the revelation came because that was fun. It's called come out. <laughs> I remember, you know, I was in Chicago with, um, with this one pastor and he had written a book called uh, Deliverance to Children's Bread. And I was like, he stole my title. So he was a good friend of mine. But anyway, I, I, I wrote a book on deliverance called Come Out because, you know, that's what you do. You know, you use your authority when you run across demons. You just say, come out of there in Jesus' name. You can't stay. Isn't that fun? And guess what they do? They get all angry at everything and want to stay and want to fight back and all that. And at the end of the day, they got to come out. That's called fun. Amen. <laughs> now, what you have here that we saw today, that's basically, you know, people, you know, I guess you could call it ignorance. That would, is that okay to use that term, ignorance? Yeah. Or not knowing. They just don't know, okay? But, but surely somebody could have told them. So what's happening is, you know, people, um, people will learn what they're, what, they're, what they're hungry for. But you can see what's going on in our nation with the dumbing down. We are in a mess in America. But guess what? It ain't over yet. Somebody say, it ain't over yet. I mean, the devil hadn't seen any. All he's done is like been poking us with a stick. But now, you know, we're waking up. Somebody say, we're waking up. We also talked about when I was here before about the about, um, you know, more about spiritual warfare because we didn't know basically anything. You know, my mother was a Baptist. You know, we didn't do a lot of spiritual warfare in my mom's church. And uh, and so what's happened in our generation is we have learned more about spiritual warfare than ever before. And we are not taking it like we used to. Amen. My grandmother, my grandmother was a spirit filled woman of God. And I remember as a little boy, when I would come home, my grandmother could pick stuff up in the spirit, you know what I mean? And uh, my grandmother had this rocking chair sitting at the front door. And uh, she, you know, I, I was, she would like watch me come, come up, you know. And I remember if I was coming up with rebellion, she'd stop me. And she'd pray for me. She said, you could come in, but that devil, the wizard with you, you can't come in. She, my, my, my grandmother did stuff like that, you know. I didn't understand what she was doing, but my grandmother wouldn't let the devil come in the house. Like some of you all, right? <laughs> anyway, moving right along here. So uh, we also started about the kingdom of God. You know, uh, like when, um, when um, we were in church, we heard mostly about the cross. And, of course, the cross is important because without the shedding of blood, there's no redemption of sin. And we need the cross. And Jesus went to the cross and died for us, right? But there was, uh, there was, uh, there was nobody preaching about the cross when Jesus was walking the earth. As a matter of fact, I don't think Jesus hardly even mentioned the cross. He was talking about the kingdom. As a matter of fact, he came preaching what? The gospel of the kingdom. He wasn't preaching the doctrine of the cross. And people were thoroughly expecting the king to arrive. And so when Jesus was crucified, it freaked everybody out. They're like, how can that be possible? Something happened here because he is the king. He's the Messiah. But what happened was they focused on the kingdom and they missed the cross. Us today, guess what we do in most churches? We focus on the cross and we miss the kingdom. And so we need both. Somebody say, well, I need both. I need both. 
And this is something that I believe is part of the restoration. You know, we heard it in the prophecy today, you know, that God's talking about restoring not only the years the canker worm devour, but also restoring unto us things God has said to us that we're not yet walking in. You know, we have to believe this, that, you know, this church gateway is a gateway. And you know what? When I was here the other day, this church isn't, this isn't in a rural community anymore. You know, we have lost our ruralness. Is that a good word? I mean, just look at the traffic. Dear Jesus, you got to pray in tongues all the way from Atlanta to get here. I mean, it's like a two-hour something drive. How many people have learned to come up another level in your prayer language on that road? Yeah, me too. And I'm like, shuko de bosanta. And I don't do good, you know, when people cut me off. You know, I got... I have like, you know, I come up another level in my tongues and it makes a different sound. You know, I mean, in the name of Jesus, boom, get out of the way. You know, anyway, that's all free. What I'm talking about, what I'm talking about is that we have fought for certain revelations that God has given us that we have not been walking in. And a lot of it has to do with the warfare we've been under. But guess what? We've seen a shift now. Somebody say it with me. We have seen a shift now. The old has passed away. Behold, I declare something new. Amen. Shall you not know it? That's what the Lord says. And so we know that prophetess Anessa here, she's talking about it. It's in the music. It's in the words. That's, that's why we're coming alive because of the gift of God in her, that prophetic gift, which, which, is, which is part of that psalmist ministry. You know, we're hearing those sounds. We're hearing those words and they're coming in. They're coming into us. Amen. But what happens is the warfare is not in here. Where the equipping is in here, but the warfare is out there. Amen? Okay. So then when I was here before, we talked about kingdom and occupying. And we talked about uh, a lot about influence that God has given us the ability to invade, occupy, influence. That's what the word possess means. You know, we, want, we think that angels are going to come and put envelopes of money in our, in our mailboxes. I mean, that might come. That might happen if it does call me over. And I can share in your blessing. But usually what happens is that we've got to fight for, we've got to contend for the blessings of God. So when God, when, see, there are, there are times when God cannot say what, what we heard in that prophecy because we're not yet ready. So what happens is because we're not ready, he won't say it. But there comes a point where we are, remember what Jesus said, you're not yet ready to hear these things, remember that? Well, what happens is when you are ready, Right. Whenever the Holy Ghost has brought you to the place where you've got that revelation. Right. Then what happens is God will prophesy to you. And here's the thing. Everything that ever happens in a church or in our lives starts with begins with a word from God. That is the launch. OK, that's the beginning of it. And so nothing new happens until the word is released. And when the word is released, there you go. OK. And that's what it says in John. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being by him and apart from him. Nothing came into being that has come into being. But notice what it says in the beginning. So everything new that happens at gateway and in our lives, you know, God will make a announcement. And so the announcement was made. Yeah. And that's why Apostle David has felt to say it over and over and over again because, he know, because he's picking up in the spirit how important it is, okay? So what we have to do, we have to grab it too because it's not just for the preacher. It's not just for the church building. Come on, it's for us because we are, we are the church. We are the ones God has gifted. Now, we might not understand everything about that, but little by little, God will reveal more and more to you. So you just walk in the light you got. Now, when the church calls for us to do things, we jump in, we get involved. Amen. Because there's an anointing on that when you get involved. So this is the thing. We at Gateway now, we are shifting into a new season. It is a new day. It is a day of restoring things that were lost, the words that were lost. You know, I was in the church when that song was written. We are the church. I was here when that song was the very weekend that song was birthed. I was here that weekend. And so that was God talking then. But whatever we've lost along the way, God said, I'm going to restore it to you. So we have to say yes and amen to that and grab a hold of it. Now, look, he's not talking about he's not. You've got to understand something here. If you're here today, then it means you're part of this word. Yeah. So you've got to grab it. How do you grab it? You grab it by faith. You say, I believe it. I receive it in Jesus name. And then what will happen is little by little, God will bring you into those circumstances where you can exercise those different gifts that's in you. Yeah. So much fun. Look, if you guys will jump in and serve God, he'll send you around the world, man, and pay for it. 
You know, our God's got plenty of money. You never try to get the money before you, before you follow the word. Money follows. It doesn't go first. Go ahead and get quiet on it because it would be good for you. Money follows. It doesn't go first. These signs shall follow them that believe. Isn't that right? So what are the signs? Well, they are the revelations that God gave us. Matthew 13 talks about uh, revelation, the mysteries of God, and all of those type of things. And this is what God has been doing. This is recent now. So we're jumping into a river now. We're jumping into the word of God. We're jumping into a flow. So what we're going to do is we're going to get loud. We're going to get noisy. I recommend you bring some noisemakers in this church. I mean, let's get loud, man. Let's get wild. Bring the pots and pans and bring some, I don't know, bring some, get some whistles. I mean, whatever you bring to the football game. Bring to this one, amen. Let's have this a noisy house, amen. That's what I do in my church. Like, Let's make some no noise. We're not going to a white church. <laughs> just saying. Make it loud. Make it proud. You know, just let's like take it up to the next level. Let's go. I sure didn't go there anyway. Anyway, I'm in the right house today, aren't I? You remember when Jesus said, Jesus was in Caesarea Philippi, and he asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? And they said, some say you're Jeremiah, one of the prophets. And then Jesus says to Peter, like he's going to single somebody out. Well, who do you say that I am? And anyway, Peter steps up and he says, thou art the Christ. You're the Messiah, right? Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And then how does Jesus respond to that? Because he's repeating something. You know what Peter's repeating? What people are thinking, but they're not saying it. They're thinking about it, but they don't they dare say it. That's what happens. You know, people, think they, they agree, but they don't have the courage yet to say it. So Peter mustered the courage and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus responded to that. And he said this, and this is what God Jesus killed. He said, I will build my church. He said, Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven has revealed it to you. And I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, I know the first thing that hit your mind when I said this is that Jesus said, no man takes my life, I lay it down. I know that. I understand that. But I'm making it a, a, a point so I, can jet, so I can get it in you so you won't forget what Jesus really is saying because we are in a generation can, that can actually say what Jesus said. Because if you were in a former generation, you would probably get stoned to death or killed for saying what I'm about to say. Jesus basically said, I'm going to build my government and the gates of hell will not prevail. Now, now all of a sudden, now things start meaning something different. You mean God's got a government in the church? Yes, he does. And guess what? We are the church. We are ambassadors. We are the Kurix, if you will. A Kurik was, uh, 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 a, was, a, was a, um, a Roman officer. And so when the Romans would take over a territory, they would send a Kurix. And the English word for Kurix is preacher. And the preacher would come, the Kurix would come representing the army, or the, I should say the government of Rome, and would come and tell the people, what the king or the emperor expected from them. So what we are going to see more and more of in the days of head is the rise of the Kurix because they are going to begin to tell the people what God expects of them. But you see, we're in a clash right now, a clash of kingdoms. Can you guys see it? You know, we are more divided today in America than ever before. And, we, and by the way, you're on the right side. Because, you know, if you look at what's going on, I mean, there are reprobates everywhere. I mean, it's almost like a carnival act. I mean, you look at some of these people, you're like, you're the department of what? I mean, we look at that. You see, that's the degeneration. And let me tell you something. These people want your children so bad, they can't taste, they, they can't stop. They're after the children. Disney now, a, a, a wonderful organization for so long, has been overcome by pedophiles, homosexuals, transgenders. And it's amazing to me that, you know, that, that this spirit is being let loose on our nation. But guess what? You can make all the laws you want to, and it won't change the word of God. Amen? And we have to understand something, that, um, 
that we are being led by the Spirit of God to be salt and light in the nation. So we are going to enter a measure of this correct word that I'm talking to you about in the days ahead like we haven't seen before. Because this thing's not over. The devil can't win. He can't win. So we have to be encouraged. But at the same time, we've got to do our part. Amen. I'm not going to Disney World this year. Because I'm not, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't want my kids hugging Mickey when I don't know what's on the other side of that costume. Just saying. Can I just say things like that? Is that all right to say that around here in Carnesville? You know, Buzz, you know, Disney's lost $40 billion this year. Because of $40 billion. Now, you would think that they'd back off some of this stuff, losing that kind of money. But they're not. They're doubling down. So what does that mean? That means there's a spirit behind it. So now you can make all the laws you want to against this and that or the other, and it's not going to stop the devil. Amen. The only authority, the only organization, if you will, organization would be the church, which is us. So what we have to do, we have to step up. Amen. And be the salt and be the light. Jesus talked about light and he talked about darkness. He said men like the darkness because their deeds are what? They're evil and they don't want to come out of the darkness. They want to stay in the darkness. Uh, I had a I had a uh, uh, a vision uh, of a mountain, and and a lightning bolt hit that mountain, bang, and it divided it in two. And what had happened was the Lord was showing me that on this mountain there were people that were on two different sides, but you couldn't tell what side they were on. And when the lightning bolt of God's authority hit, it split that mountain, and people made a decision what side of the mountain they wanted to be on. They weren't there by mistake. They were there by decision. Those of you that are here today, you're not here by mistake. You're here by decision. You decided to come to church. You wanted to be around God. You wanted to hear what God had to say. You wanted to, you wanted to have the mysteries of God revealed. You wanted to find out something about your identity. And that's what we're seeing all over America. We're seeing a fight for identity. I wrote a book a couple years ago when this thing first started, you know. I couldn't believe that Facebook came out with 72 different genders. 72 different genders. It was, it was several years ago before, you know, they kind of narrowed it down more this time. But, uh, you know, I wrote a book about this, and it was an attack upon manhood. Men have been under attack for a long time, and I, I've been preaching that men, guess what? Jesus didn't die on a cross to have only a woman's ministry. That we ought to have as many men in this church as we have women in this church. And I thank God for the women because if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't have much of a church. But we need men in the church. Amen. And the reason why we don't have more men in the church is because we're preaching to women instead of preaching to men. Where's the car at? Is it close by? Where's my car keys at? Let me just get close here. I'm glad I'm at Gateway. I, I mean, anyway, it's so quiet in here, Apostle David. I'm not used to this stuff. That's what I'm telling y'all next week. You better bring them whistles, right? Eric, bring some whistles. Pass them out. Amen. We'll make some noise in Jesus' name. The Bible says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Somebody shout amen. Um, I want to read this by, uh, this is a, a French writer. From the, 15th, from the 16th century. Let me read what he said about liberty, okay? And what he's basically going to talk about is how we are being ruled over because we've not fought back. And uh, we don't love liberty like we say we do. So he writes about this, and this is an observation that he has in the 16th century. He says, liberty is the only joy upon which men do not seem to insist. For surely if they really wanted it, they would receive it. Apparently they refuse this wonderful privilege because it is so easily acquired. Poor, wretched, and stupid people, nations determined on your own misfortune and blind to your own good. You let yourselves be deprived before your own eyes of the best part of your revenues. Your fields are plundered, your homes robbed, your family heirlooms taken away, your gas prices jacked up to you know where. He didn't say that, I added that. You live in such a way that you cannot claim a single thing as your own. Isn't that what Kloss 
uh, said the other day, the head of the president of the World Economic Forum over in, over in uh, England, he said, you will own nothing and you will like it. This is what's saying. You know, well, somebody's got to tell him, we already defeated you years ago, 1776. We need to remind you, we're not going to come under British rule in America. Amen. And so I noticed, I noticed this the other day. How many of y'all ever had DVDs? You got a DVD and you bought the DVD and you have DVDs at your house? Do you know that, that some, of those, some of those good movies like we might want to watch around Christmas time, now you can't buy the DVDs anymore. You have to stream them. So there's a sign of you will own nothing. You will stream it and you'll be happy. They don't want you to own a thing. Look what's happening with the inflation rate. You know, we're sending all of these billions and billions of dollars overseas. And what's happening is we, the taxpayers, are funding it through, through uh, inflation. You know, you can't continue to live in America with 9% inflation rates. It's going to destroy us. It has to be handled. And our president even today is talking about getting on the gas station's uh, case about, and telling, trying to tell us that the gas stations are ripping us off. They only make about two cents a gallon, folks. You know, so the gas stations aren't the problem. Shutting down the pipeline is the problem. Mm -hmm. I think I'll run for the president of Georgia. Uh, I think Andrew over here do better than me. Is your name Andrew again? Or, oh, it's Andy. Sorry about that. He said, you let yourself be deprived. Your fields are plundered. Your homes are robbed. Your family heirlooms taken away. You live in such a way that you cannot claim a single thing as your own. And it would seem that you consider yourselves lucky to be loaned your property, your families, and your very lives. All this havoc, this misfortune, this ruin descends upon you not from alien foes, but from the one enemy whom yourselves render as powerful as he is, for whom you go bravely to war, for whose greatness you do not refuse to offer your own bodies unto death. He who thus domineers over you has only two eyes, he only has two hands, he only has one body, and no more than is possessed by the least men among the infinite numbers dwelling in your cities. He has indeed nothing more than the power that you confer upon him to destroy you. Where has he acquired enough eyes to spy upon you if you do not provide them yourselves? How can he have so many arms to beat you with if he does not borrow them from you? The fields, the feet that trample down your cities, where does he get them if they are not your own? How does he have any power over you except through you? How would he dare assail you if he had no cooperation from you? What could he do to you if you yourselves did not connive with the thief who plunders you? If you were not accomplices of the murderer who kills you, if you were not traitors to yourself. Ooh, boy, he's hitting it, isn't he? He says, you sow your crops in order that he may ravage them. You install and furnish your homes to give him goods to pillage. From all these indignities, such as the very beast of the field would not endure, you can deliver yourselves if you try, not by taking action, but merely by willing to be free. Resolve to serve no more, and you are at once free. I do not ask you to place hands upon the tyrants to topple them over, but simply that you support him no longer. Then you will behold him like a great colossus whose pedestal has been pulled away, fall of his own weight and breath unto pieces. Amen. That's what he said. So what he's basically underlining is what Jesus said, you know, who the son sets free is free indeed. When I was here before, I talked about Exodus chapter 20. In Exodus 20, verse 1, it says that, I am the Lord thy God. I'm the one that delivered you out of the house of bondage. And he said it five times. I am the Lord thy God. I am the one that delivered you out of the house of bondage, out of Pharaoh's house. So now we have to understand something. When he's talking about bondage, he's talking about out of Pharaoh's economic system out of Pharaoh's bondage, his system. And so God says, I am the Lord your God. I'm the one that delivered you out of that hell, out of that economic bondage. You know, the people, they, 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 had, they had sold everything they had. Their vineyards are gone. 
Their farms are gone. Their houses are gone. They indentured their children. They had absolutely nothing. And then they cried out to the Lord, and God heard their prayers. And what did he do? He came down to deliver them out of the bondage. Amen. This is a merciful God. This is the God we serve. So he reminds us over and over again, I am the Lord thy God. I brought you out of that bondage. Don't forget it. Don't forget it. So he uses the word Elohim, and he's talking about, you know, healer, protector, provider, deliverer. That's what he's talking about. I'm your healer. I'm your protector. I'm your provider. I'm your deliverer. I am the Lord your God. Don't forget me. I'm the one that brought you out of the house of bondage. So then later on, you know, we see, we see uh, one of the Ten Commandments where he says that thou shalt not use the Lord's name in vain. You guys know that scripture? One of the Ten Commandments, one of the Ten Suggestions, where he says you shouldn't use the Lord's name in vain. You guys familiar with that? Do you know what? Since I can remember, people associated that with not cursing, that you certain curse. And, uh, you know, maybe that's true. You know, maybe I, sh you know, <laughs> we probably all curse at some point, except for the people in the back. <laughs> but, uh, you know, some of us have cursed, right? We have, we have said some curse words, especially in the traffic on 85. <laughs> but um, I don't think that that's what he means. I really think this. I think what it means is those of you that have taken the name, that you have associated yourself with the house of God, that you've taken the name. And you've taken the name of God in vain. The Bible says, don't take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, right? But what he's talking about is that you have taken the name of the Lord to yourself, right? You've identified yourself with the house of God. So in other words, if a person would take the name of the Lord in vain, it means that you've taken the Lord's name, but you've done nothing with it. And that's what this man's trying to say, you know, because you've done nothing with the name. And the Bible says, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. So what do we have to do? We're identifying ourselves with the house of God because we're born again. The devil knows whether or not you're born again or not because he can see what house you're associated with. So when you're associated through covenant, right, with the house of God, now all of a sudden, guess what? If you take the Lord's name in vain, in other words, you don't do nothing with it, then you violated that commandment. So God is expecting us to do something with the name because that name is powerful. There's nothing like the name of Jesus. And God has given us a name whereby we can preach the word and we can decree and we de can declare. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, let me just wrap this up. I'm almost done here. Let's see. What time is it? 1230? Quarter to one? 1130? Go with me to Isaiah chapter 61. Are you enjoying this or am I doing okay up here? Apostle David says that all the time. Now I know why he says it. I know why because you guys are listening. Go to Isaiah 61. In verse 1, the spirit of the Lord is what? Of the Lord God is what? Upon me because the Lord has anointed me to what? Preach good tidings or good news unto what? The meek. He that sent me to what? Bind up the brokenhearted. Watch this now. And, to, and what? To proclaim liberty. The word liberty is Dior, okay? To proclaim liberty, that's freedom, to the captives and opening of the prison to them that are bound. So you can see part of the anointing is to deal with the captivity of the people. What's happening is that people are being enslaved. We're in a warfare for identity right now. We've got men that don't know they're men. You've got women that are, don't know they're women. You've got children that are identifying with all these different things. This is a battle for identity, amen? Our identity comes out of the Word of God. It's God who says who we are, amen? The narrative from the world, the amoral, perilous crazies out there, they're not the ones that tell us who we are. We get our identity from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, amen, from the one that saved us. God said, let us make man in our image. The only time I ever seen, the only time, watch this. I, I, I saw, uh, you remember the, 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 the damsel that was demon possessed? Remember that? She followed Paul and the company around saying these men are the most high God. Listen to what they have to say. You remember that girl? And then Paul got upset about it after a spell and he turned around and he said, what? Come out of her. And the Bible says a he came out of a her. Now, we need some of that same anointing today because there, there is some he's that need to come out of some hers. 
<laughs> to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. To comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that, that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be what called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. And they, had, they shall build, watch now, the old, play, the old waste. They shall raise up the former desolations. And they shall repair the waste cities, the desolation of many generations. And strangers shall stand and feed your flocks. And the sons of the aliens shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. But you shall be named the priests of the Lord and shall call you to the ministers of our God. And you shall eat the riches of the Gentiles. And in their glory shall you boast yourselves. This is what the anointing does. The anointing breaks the yoke. Amen. It removes the burdens, and we walk in that anointing. The anointing is the power of God on the word of God that comes out of your mouth. Amen. It never comes out without accomplishing that which it is sent to do. So this is what God has given us to do. Now, in Acts chapter 3, verse 19, go there. Acts chapter 3, 19, verse 19. It says in verse, uh, no, chapter 3, verse 19. Did I say that? Chapter 3, verse 19. Are you there? Don't lie. Well, if you do lie, come down to the altar here. Let Andrew pray for you. It says, repent you therefore and be converted that your sins might be blotted out. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So how long had that been preached? Since the world began. That's a long time. Now, when you see the word heaven here, I think this will help you because if I ask 20 people where heaven is, I'd probably get 20 different answers. But there's another scripture that says we are seated together with Christ in heavenly places. You guys heard that scripture before? So now what we see is that heaven is a place, but it's also a position. So he is high and lifted up, right? And the Bible says we are seated together with Christ in heavenly places. And I like to look at it like this in the commanding heights. Because Jesus is higher than all principalities and all powers. And you and I are seated together in the commanding heights. The devil can't touch you. You're seated together in the commanding heights. Amen? So it says here, it says here that, um, that whom the heaven are the commanding heights must receive until the times of the restitution of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So now I was praying about this and trying to get the answer to this. Like, what does this mean? And uh, here's what I think God said to me. That uh, he said it like this to me to try to simplify it. As it was in the beginning, so shall it be in the end. That's what I believe God said to me to answer this question. And um, so then, so then I had to then say, okay, well, what were things like in the beginning? Well, in the beginning, there was only one God, only one family, only one kingdom. That was it. Now, we know when Abel and Cain got in that fight, that Cain killed his brother because he wouldn't tithe, Apostle David. He wanted to give God a gift. He wanted to give God a gift his own way. He wouldn't tithe. And because God wouldn't receive that, because God wanted the firstlings, not an offering. So Cain wouldn't do it God's way. So what happens is God wouldn't receive it. Cain gets angry and he kills his brother. The first murder in the word of God was over tithing. And tithing is us saying, God, we acknowledge our covenant with you. That's what tithing is all about. That we're acknowledging that we've got a covenant with God. 
So then Cain kills his brother, murders him, gets angry because God wouldn't receive his offer in his way. So you can't do everything your own way. We've got to submit to God after the due order, right? So then what happens? He goes out of rebellion. He leaves the house of God. He's no longer identifying himself with the house of God. And he goes and builds a house out of rebellion. We call it Babylon. And what do we see? We see the division of kingdoms. As it was in the beginning, so shall it be in the end. What was it like in the beginning? There was an obvious division of kingdoms. What do we see today? A division of kingdoms, right? We look around, you, see, you watch ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox News, and CNN and all that. What do you keep hearing? The narrative of that other kingdom. The narrative of that other kingdom. And their leaders and their prophets and their apologists and all of that. And they keep telling us all the time who we are, who we are, who we are, who we are. And they keep propping up their, their people, their Remember what Jesus, what God said, you shall have no other, no other gods before me, no other voices before mine. So when you're listening to Fox News and CNN, you're listening to other voices. So we got to be careful what voices we're listening to. Amen. We got to listen to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So how was it in the beginning? In the beginning, it was God ruling over man and man ruling over man. See the differences? So what we have today in our government, unfortunately, is man ruling over man. So what we got to do is we got to step up. We've got to know this. The preachers that I talk to, that I, I know some smart people that are liberals. Makes me wonder how they could be liberal like they are when they're so smart. And I tell them this. I say, you know, you all need to stay out of that. You don't need to be. When I went to Washington, you know, I went to uh, the State Department. I went to see... Uh, uh, President Trump, which I never did get to see. But when I went there, you know, when I went to Washington and I met all of these people, my mindset was that I am an ambassador of Christ, that I'm not a Republican and I'm not a Libertarian and I'm not a Democrat. My focus is I'm, I'm, a, I'm a man of God and I'm here to speak for those that have no voice. And that's why I'm here. I'm here to talk about the different things that were going on in the different nations that I was in and the genocide and things like that and the abuse and, and just all of those things that were taking place. But my mindset was I'm not a liberal and I'm not a conservative. I'm a man of God. That's who I am. Now, if you want to call me a conservative, then that's what I am. Because, but it's only because of my relationship with God. And let me tell you this for the people that are watching uh, on, on the Internet. The Democratic Party today. It's not the Democratic Party of your mother and father and grandparents. This Democratic Party has been hijacked by progressive Marxists. They're not the Democrats of your grandparents. So you've got to recognize this is something different. This is a Marxist spirit. This is a murdering spirit. They've got their slogan, you know, that this whole build back better. That didn't come. That wasn't unique for President Biden. That came out of Europe. Build back better is a European socialist motto. It's a slogan. And so what they mean is tear everything down that's Christian so that we can build back better as it was in the beginning. Let it be so in the end. See what I mean? Where you've got God ruling over man, which is our God, and we've got man ruling over man, which is their God. But that's not us. And Jesus gave us instruction in John chapter 3. He says it. Let's go there, and I'm gonna end, I'll be able to end with, with this. How many closings do I get? Get three in the Baptist church and seven in the Pentecostal church. Go, <laughs> go to John chapter 3. Let's hurry, okay? Uh, verse 15, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have what? Eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. Yeah? but that the world through him might be saved. So you see God's heart. He doesn't want everybody to go to hell. Amen. He wants them to be saved. That should be our, that should, that, that word saved really is uh, the Greek word sozo, which means made whole. Okay. So he that, uh, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name. There's that name of the holy begotten son of God. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world 
And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, right? Neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God. Somebody say amen. Amen, amen, amen. 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 And John 8, 36 says that who the Son sets free is free indeed. So here's the deal, guys. We're fighting for identity now, and we're going to have to be the light that God has called us to be. But we're in a battle. This is a a time when we have to understand that we are in a a time of warfare. And uh, we're going to win. We're not going to lose. We've already won. We just got to walk it out. Amen. Amen. But every single person is important. So we've got to be careful with the political thing. You know, know, Jesus um, suffered a lot from politicians. He sure did. You know, when you, when you have religion and politicians mix up together, you get crucified. And that's what happened to Jesus. But I believe that God is equipping us for the time we live in. But we're going to come up another level. Somebody say we're coming up another level. You know, I'm a grandfather. I'm not going to let the devil take my grandkids from me. And you're not going to have some drag queen reading a book to my, my little three-year-old grandson. Not going to happen. Can you imagine some drag queen, Apostle David, going over there and wanting to have a meeting with John Paul? Isn't that your new grandson? I think we'd be having some some Carnesville cartel situation going on here. You know, the, the Bible says, what is it? The kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent take it by force, something like that. Is there a scripture that says that? And, and, I, and I noticed, too, you got a new pistol last time I was here. Rifle, rifle, got a new rifle to go practice with. Right. Stand up on your feet, everybody. I hope you enjoyed that. That's all I got for you. Next, next, next time we'll preach something different, okay? Somebody say this with me. You know, in the book of Job, it says that you can decree a thing and it will be established. Do you believe it? Say it with me. I believe that I can decree the word of God and it'll happen for me. So say this with me. I decree the keys of the kingdom of heaven have been given unto me and whatsoever I bind on earth is bound in heaven and whatsoever I loose on earth is loose in heaven. Say this with me. I decree no weapon formed against me shall prosper and every tongue that shall rise against me in judgment shall be condemned I decree I am blessed coming in I'm blessed going out I am the head and not the tail above only and not beneath I decree I am strong in the Lord and the power of his might as I put on the whole armor of God and stand against all the wiles of the devil I decree my steps are ordered every day by the Lord I decree all things work together for my good because I love God and I'm called according to his purpose. I decree God is my refuge and my strength. He's a very present help in times of trouble. I decree the favor of God. If God before me, who can be against me? I decree I delight myself in the Lord and he gives me the desires of my heart. I decree I have the peace of God that passes all understanding in Jesus' name. Come on, give God a hand clap. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.